¿no? Freeform micro optics have the capabilities to revolutionize industries. Imagine automotive lighting that is perfectly aligned with the design of the car. Or lighting solutions that provide better energy efficiency, better light distribution, and perfect aesthetics. Imagine all AR and VR capabilities with better resolution, feeling more realistic, yet the device reduced to a size that you don't even realize you are wearing. Or improving your home with luxury and smart windows. That is the power of freeform microoptics. The ability to create optical shapes in any form you want, completely miniaturized for perfect integration. Opening up new opportunities for security and branding, optical communications, consumer electronics, and more. And now imagine that this can be done with equal or even better specifications than conventional systems, and at lower costs. This is why Fabulous has opened up the one-stop shop in freeform microoptics making this technology now easily accessible to everyone who wants to implement it, proving a full supply chain of world-class freeform micro-optic specialists. We can take you from design to prototyping and into pilot production. For full product life cycle, including design, modeling, origination, tooling, and manufacturing services, some have already paved the way by integrating freeform micro-optics into their product portfolio. Are you ready to take the next step in your product development? Make it fabulous. And contact the one-stop shop for freeform microoptics at info at fabulous.eu. We are fabulous. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jeremy Pico Clement, Technology Manager at Epic, and I'm really pleased to welcome you for this workshop, fabulous workshop. Uh, of today on uh, freeform micro optics for uh, general lighting application. Uh, the aim of this workshop is uh, for you as participant to get the maximum information of Fabulous, uh, which is a European pilot line for the manufacturing of freeform uh, micro optical components, and also get answers, of course. So that's why um, after each presentation, you will have time to ask questions. Uh, so you are warmly invited to ask any of your questions during this uh, workshop. A few words about Fabulous. Uh, Fabulous is the European pilot line and one-stop shop for the manufacturing of freeform micro-optics. The project, the pilot line, offers a full supply chain for accelerating innovation and production cycles, manufacturing uh, services, and uh, from prototyping to large volume production, including uh, piloting of uh, your project. So who, uh, who is Fabulous? So Fabulous is a European project, a European pilot line, um, and we have partners from all Europe, actually. As you can see, we work with a research and development uh, center, but also with industrial partners uh, spreading all over Europe. Um, few words also about what kind of services Fabulous can provide to you. Uh, so production services like uh, modeling, origination, tooling, materials, and also quality control, uh, UV imprint manufacturing, uh, like your wafer scale, wall to print, and also wall to wall, product integration, and also technology valid validation. And we have some use cases already in transport lighting, automotive lighting, AR, VR, micro display as well and luxury and i really invite you to check the fabulous website and uh, we have a web page dedicated to use cases um, and it will give you a, a lot of ideas of what we can do for you a uh, few words about also the workshop uh, of today so we'll have seven speakers uh, we will focus on uh, freeform micro optics for lighting application general lighting why we decided to um, to focus this workshop on this topic especially uh, because uh, yeah freeform micro optics bring a lot of advantages compared to conventional techniques uh, like a reduction of um, of the optical system size for example so form factor it improves also uh, the efficiency of the global system you can have a better light control and uh, it gives you some uh, uh, opportunity to customize um, your product 
There is a new services, uh, new service for uh, from Fabulous. Um, so you can start now a feasibility study uh, with a Fabulous pilot line. You can get up to two months of development effort by uh, our partners, with a maximum of contribution of two thousand euros. The process uh, is really simple, um, and you can have a quick evaluation. So you can have more information on the website again, um, and uh, you can also send us an email. You can send me an email or send an email to Jessica Van Eck. Um, here is the agenda with today's event. So we'll have a presentation, the first presentation from uh, Jonas Villans on, uh, from Villans UPMT on freeform micro optics for general lighting manufacturing solutions. Marek Skiren uh, from Nanoptics on nanostructured optics for LED lighting. Then Julie Bonetto from Piseo on a freeform optics design. Beno Spinger uh, from LumiLeds on fusion of micro lens and micro lens. Rife Lutz from Leopil on a micro nanostructure and freeform optics for lighting application. Then Henrik Madsen from SPIO Systems uh, on miniaturized optical engines on wafer level via, via uh, SPIO technology. And uh, last speaker of the day, Knut uh, Benemeyer from Technoting, te Techno Team, sorry, measurement of ray data for micro optics with near field Bonio photometers. So thank you for be very much for being here. Um, again, do not hesitate to ask any question after the presentation. Here you have our um, contact, email contact, so my email contact, and also the contact of Jessica Van Eck from, uh, from Fabulous. So thank you again for your participation. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Jonas, uh, Jonas Villans, CFO of Villans UPMT. Jonas, you can start your, your presentation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Very good. Yes. Uh, so thank you for attending this, this workshop and for inviting us to give a presentation. Uh, so today my presentation will uh, focus on our solutions for manufacturing of free form micro optical elements for general lighting. Um, so maybe first a few words about our company, what we do. Uh, so usually we don't provide uh, optical design. Uh, I've seen that we will have presentations today about optical design. Usually our customers come to us with their own optical design and they are looking for a solution to manufacture their, their uh, elements. And so that's where we can provide some solutions. Um, today I will focus the presentation on two different types of services that we can provide. The first one is uh, uh, ultra precision manufacturing services for machined molds, masters, inserts. Uh, the second one is one step further, uh, providing replicated uh, plastic optical elements. Uh, but let's first focus on uh, ultra precision machined uh, parts. So of course we can provide uh, general ultra precision diamond machining services uh, like you can find uh, on other by other workshops. Um, with those technologies, you can apply two or three axis machining for making spheres, A spheres, uh, free forms. Uh, we can apply ruling, uh, which is a process where you use the diamond tool to uh, scratch the surface of a uh, of a metallic plate, for example, to manufacture linear uh, gratings or linear optical surfaces. Uh, we can also provide milling services, uh, but today I want to focus the presentation on a technology that we have developed in-house, which is a very specific technology to our company, which we have called DPI. Uh, what is DPI? So um, basically DPI is a technology that we have developed to provide a solution to manufacture multiple optical surfaces on one single substrate. Uh, so basically when you want to machine optical surfaces uh, by a chip removal uh, process like milling or turning, 
you would always choose a turning process if you can do so. And why is it so? It's because it is well known that turning will provide you a better roughness, a better uh, shape uh, accuracy compared to a milling process, for example. Unfortunately, when you want to make, for example, freeform surfaces, it's not always possible to do it by turning because turning requires a certain uh, symmetry of revolution of the surface you want to machine. Uh, so while it is sometimes possible to machine one sing single surface by turning, uh, usually when you want to make an array of those surfaces, it becomes very tricky and mostly people will go to a milling process. So our idea was to adapt and provide a solution to manufacture arrays of optical surfaces by the best technology available, namely diamond turning. So that's what DPI uh, uh, can do. Uh, so DPI is uh, called dynamic part indexing. So it is a device and a process that allows us to sequentially align each optical axis of each optical surface you want to machine on a part with the axis of the mili of the turning spindle. Okay, so by doing so, you can sequentially machine each optical surface as if it is one single surface on one single part. Okay, and you will get the very best accuracy and surface finish you can get on one part, but you will get that on each surface of the lens array. So with this technology, you can increase a lot the design freedom you have when you want to machine such parts. And this technology allows you, for example, to make an array of freeform lenses. So if you look at this part, uh, you have, I believe there were about 300 lenses on this part. Each lens is a freeform lens. Um, described by a Zernike polynomial, but each lens is different from the other, which is perfectly feasible because we do them in a sequential process. Uh, as you can see, you also have a very sharp edge between the lenses. So this is caused by what we call natural intersection between the lenses. So you really can have the optical surfaces crossing each other with a rounding there that will be very, very sharp. So you don't lose any uh, light there. So this is possible. Of course, you can also make arrays of single lenses. So these are, uh, for example, lenses that can be used for endoscopy application, uh, but you can make hundreds or thousands of these lenses on one single substrate. Of course, these lenses can also be freeform lenses. You can also make, of course, arrays of lens arrays. As you can see on this picture, I believe this master was containing about 20,000 lenses with approximately 100 lens arrays. Uh, so this is also totally feasible. Uh, for example, when you want to avoid a step and repeat process to uh, uh, make uh, a, the, the final fully populated master. Uh, so here I give you a few numbers uh, about what this technology can achieve. So as I said, you can of course make A spheres. You can make what we called what we have called mild freeforms. So of course, with a turning process, you cannot make a vertical wall, for example. So you still need a certain slope there and a certain amount of symmetry, but uh, it can be quite free form. Uh, so you have some limitations because you only always need 
a diamond tool to fit into the cavity and to be able to machine the surface without any collision problems. But uh, mild freeforms are possible. Feature sizes, usually we start above 10 microns. Again, this is limited by the, the size of the diamond tool you will use. Uh, same for the lens sag. Uh, you can see that you can go very, very high in terms of lens sag. Uh, it can be bigger than that, of course, but uh, the shape accuracy will be very good. And the roughness can be very, very, very low. What's interesting is that you don't need any post-processing to get down to numbers like this, two, three nanometers RA. So it's really optical uh, quality. You can have very, very, very high slopes. Uh, you will see a few examples in the next slides. slides. So each lens can go up to 80, 85 degrees. Uh, as you've seen, you can have very sharp intersections between the lenses. Uh, one point we've been working on a lot in the last years is the, the position accuracy of each of these lenses. So as you can imagine, when you machine 20,000 lenses, uh, you would need to be sure to achieve a XY position accuracy that is very accurate. Uh, and we've been able to downsize this to lower than one micron uh, XY position and better than plus minus 0.5 micron in terms of Z accuracy. Um, the materials we can machine are all the diamond machinable materials, uh, mostly nickel phosphorus, but you can have PMMA, brass or whatever. Um, what are the applications? So when we sell a mold or a master like this, usually our, our customer will do the replication himself, uh, mostly uh, by an imprinting uh, process. Uh, we've been involved in many different types of, of applications. Uh, of course, recently for automotive headlight or ground projection, but we've also worked uh, for general lighting applications, consumer electronics, uh, augmented reality applications, um, endoscopy, as, I've, as I said. Uh, so you can imagine we can deliver uh, uh, lighting or imaging quality. So you can apply this technology to a lot of different uh, markets. The second uh, type of service that we can provide is a, a replication uh, service. So we don't provide anymore only the mold insert, but we use this mold in insert ourselves to provide a final plastic uh, element. Um, for this, we have developed two different processes. Uh, first one, which is an adapted injection molding process really dedicated to manufacture arrays of optical elements. A second one, which is a compression molding uh, process uh, really that we have called iFi optics, uh, really dedicated to manufacture extreme shapes, very high slopes, for example. The injection molding process, it's quite easy to understand. Uh, we always start by making a mold ourselves with DPI, then we have adapted, as I said, an injection molding process to make lens arrays on a wafer level, um, quite similar to an, an imprinting process at the end. Then we can, for example, apply a coating on those lenses, dice them, and you will obtain the final, the final part. Here again, a few numbers about this. As I've said, uh, it's mostly adapted to make arrays of lenses um, so you can get thicknesses of about 0.5 to 3 millimeters the slope of course is quite limited as i've said you can the, the machining of the mold itself you can have much higher slopes than that but the injection molding process is limited here uh, but still you can have 100 percent fill factor uh, you can imagine to mold a lot of different plastic materials, um, different applications we've been involved in are, for example, uh, lens arrays for LiDAR applications, uh, diffusers, 
uh, light shaping uh, and so on. Now the compression molding process. So it's a bit the same kind of process, except that we add an additional molding step uh, where we put uh, a mold that we've manufactured with DPI into a special press, which will uh, heat up and cool down the entire system such that you have really an isothermal uh, manufacturing step, which of course is slower than injection molding, but you can parallelize a lot thanks to our DPI uh, manufacturing technology such that it remains a very effective process. Uh, and also by molding slower than injection molding, you can achieve much better accuracies when the design becomes very extreme. For example, you can achieve very high slopes up to 75 degrees, can achieve, we've worked a lot on alignment of both surfaces. Uh, so we can go down to one, two, one or two microns uh, accuracy in terms of uh, alignment. You can mold very thin sections. You can also have a very high aspect ratio. So uh, the ratio between the thickest and the thinnest section of your lens can be very high. And so with this uh, technology, for example, we've made, we've made this kind of parts, which is very specific. So it was a, a part with four different segments. Each segment is a free form. Uh, and with a different freeform prescription. Uh, so this, and I believe the, the edge, the slope at the edge here was about 65 degrees. With exactly the same process, you can also imagine to make uh, linear uh, slanted structures like this. So this is a molded plastic uh, part with slants of a height up to one millimeter, I believe. Uh, so it's a very, very accurate process where you can, at the end, replicate any mold we have manufactured using our machining solutions. Now I, I get to the, the final questions. Uh, so what, what we can do for, for you? Uh, so as, as you've seen, we can provide unique solutions for manufacturing of very challenging designs. Uh, this is really uh, what we propose to our customers is uh, our solutions to make parts that they were not able to manufacture up to now. Um, of course, we also provide uh, our su support for design for manufacturing. So we always try to be involved as early as possible in the design of the, the optical parts. Uh, knowing the limitations of, of the manufacturing processes. Um, we can also, so we provide also solutions to make parts from prototyping volumes to higher volumes. We can make even one-offs if you want, um, but we can also go to much higher volumes. Um, now what you can do for us, uh, well, of course, uh, you can challenge our manufacturing processes. Uh, now we are always looking for, for example, new plastic materials uh, because we have requests from customers willing to reduce by refringents, for example, for augmented reality applications, uh, get different ranges of refractive indices and provide solutions for other steps of the manufacturing process. For example, singulation solutions, coating solutions. Uh, coating can be tricky on plastic parts, for example. So we are always interested to know more about that. Okay, that's, that's it for me. Okay, thank you very much, Jonas, for this nice presentation. So any question for, for Jonas, we can raise your your hands through through Zoom. Um, I have just one one question, maybe um, regarding your um, your involvement in in, in uh, Fabulous. I wanted to to ask you. Yes. 
Or, sure. Or, so yeah. uh, as, as you said, we are involved in, in the fabulous pilot line as an origination partner. So we provide origination services. Uh, we've been involved in different use cases, uh, automotive use cases, lighting use cases. Uh, so we've been manufacturing uh, masters uh, that were further used either for nano imprinting, so uh, uh, wafer uh, level uh, optical imprinting, or uh, we've been also manufacturing uh, drums, for example, for uh, roll to roll replication. Thank you. And, and you mentioned during your presentation that you have some needs in terms of, uh, you know, coating. Um, yes. Do you have a, do you have a specification? Do you have something more to, to tell us in terms of coating today or? It's more no, uh, not really, but uh, we, we know from our experience that this can be a tricky yeah. uh, part of the manufacturing process. Uh, the adhesion mostly of uh, coatings on plastic substrates mm. can be tricky. Uh, so we've uh, experienced uh, from time to time uh, peeling of uh, coating on, on plastic substrates. So we know that in certain cases it can be a, a challenge. Mm. Okay, thank you, Jonas. You're welcome. Any 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 question? Any more question? Okay, thanks. So if you need the precision and, and quality, uh, yeah, you can contact Jonas. You can also contact us, and we will uh, introduce you to 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 Jonas, but uh, also to the other speakers today. Thank you again, Jonas. And uh, yeah, now let's uh, move to our next speaker. So Mike Skiran, um, CTO of uh, Nanoptics. And you will talk about nanostructure optics for LED lighting. So, Marek, you can share your screen and start your presentation. OK, so can you see my screen? Yes. OK, thank so you. good afternoon once again. First of all, I would like to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present what we are doing at the uh, company IQS Nanoptics, which is focused primarily on nanostructures optics for uh, LED lighting systems. So let me start with a few words about the company and about its history. So technically speaking, we were founded in 2020, but we exist for much longer as a part of IQS Group Holdings since 2012. We are situated in Czech Republic, uh, based in the small village Rež u Prahy, close to the capital city, where there is management, sales, R&D production, uh, virtually everything. And we have our small subsidiary in uh, Brno, the second largest city in Czech Republic. Uh, we have more than, the history is in fact much longer, we have more than 25 years of experience in the field of uh, micro and nanostructures. We started in mid 90s uh, in, in holographic business and then involved to company with, with uh, more directions uh, uh, of activities. So, but I, our main focus was always development production and sale of functional products with micro and nanostructured surfaces. The plastic is in parentheses because we actually can produce also, or we are producing also some metallic surfaces with nanostructures. We have been always strongly focused on research and development, and we still maintain broad cooperation with Academy of Sciences and universities, and uh, we are solving a lot of, a lot of uh, research grant projects. Uh, we strongly rely on in-house developed know-how and technologies, which is a big advantage for our customers as well, because we can make the development process and the production process pretty, pretty quick and flexible. The company is rapidly growing. So currently we have already more than 100 employees. We are members of several associations uh, in relation to, uh, to our uh, fields, of, uh, fields of interest and if we um, comply some standards which are also related to, this, to these activities. IQS Group Holding Company consists of three main daughter companies and all of them, what they have in common, so they focus on design, mastering and mass production of nanostructured elements. Optical, again, is in parentheses because recently we also started to, uh, to be active in uh, general modification of surfaces using micro and nanostructures. Because these three daughter companies are heavily cooperating, so it's good to explain what they are doing because we are benefiting from the synergy of these companies. Uh, so first of them, first daughter company is IQ Structures, which is focused on optical document security. This is the traditional business we are coming from. And uh, today this means that we are focused on IDs, passports and, uh, and uh, banknotes. We have a volume production for these products. Uh, just to give you a picture, our capacity is something like more than 50 million passport pages per year. 
The second daughter, comp daughter company is IQS Nanoptics, which is primarily focused on uh, nanostructured optics for LED lighting systems, but also for other applications like sensors and, and similar. And the last, uh, uh, last daughter company is IQS Nano, which is focused on different types of mastering uh, approaches. And the primary focus is currently uh, 3D uh, high resolution, high speed nanoprinting. Uh, where we are also developing the devices and selling the devices. What you can see here is the, the current generation of the printer which we are selling. Maybe you can ask yourself what uh, do have these three companies in common, but if you look more uh, in detail from technical point of view, you will see that they are all dealing with very similar micro and nanostructures. Uh, the typical uh, typical structure in the document security application are holographic gratings and blaze gratings. In optics, it's more about, uh, uh, let's say, micro and nanoprismatic structures, micro lenses. Uh, with uh, IQS Nano, it's about high frequency gratings and general 3D structures. Because our R&D and uh, productions are, are interconnected, so we can not only uh, combine these uh, structures on top of each other, but we can also combine them on the, single, on the same substrate, which is in many applications a big, big benefit. So uh, what is the main philosophy of the company? We are focused on intense research and development in all these directions, not only in technology, but also in creating a new, new applications, new field of applications. As I already mentioned, we uh, we are trying to have the technology completely under one roof, which is a big benefit and which increases uh, our flexibility. And we focus on in-house developed technologies, at least in the in the key directions. And last but not least, we prefer the applications when effective mass production is an important parameter because this is what we what we learn how to do in last uh, last three decades of existence of um, of our team. Uh, so now let me uh, just briefly summarize what we are doing in nanostructured optics for lighting system. I think you are mostly familiar with this. So just uh, uh, let's keep it simple. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to replace this old fashioned light shaping systems, which we used in the, in the, in the times of uh, fluorescent tubes and, uh, and uh, incandescent bulbs uh, based on reflection and refraction, uh, which today usually in time of LED have this form, but we are trying to replace them with a flat optics, which is not based on refraction or reflection, but on diffraction from a tiny surface nanostructure. Using, uh, using uh, nanostructure to shape the light has in principle two groups of advantages. The first one is functional, because by using this kind of structure, we have much better control over the, over the, uh, over the uh, light, uh, because we can create virtually any light distribution in space. So that's a functional advantage. The technological advantage is that because these structures are very thin, typically we are working just with few microns or few tens of microns, then instead of, uh, let's say, slow manufacturing technologies like injection molding and extrusion and similar, we can use something much closer to, to printing. Uh, and it can be a road to road process, uh, either embossing process or, or UV casting or something similar. From point of view of products, uh, we are uh, focusing on the luminaires, which are extremely lightweight, extremely thin, powerful, with low carbon footprint, and with very good uh, control over the light distribution in space. So this is a short story. What we are trying to do in optics, uh, the, the long story, the short story is that we are trying to replace this with this in, in, in different, different applications. Just to give you an idea, how our standard products look like. So what we are producing, here is just a small selection. We are producing films in form of sheets or reels if you need it, but we also produce nanostructures on rigid uh, uh, plastic plates, either flat or curved. We produce auxiliary components like micro reflectors based on, uh, again, on, on very thin films, so they are lightweight, very economical. And last but not least, we also produce more complex multi-component optical systems like you can see here, which combine uh, principles uh, like refraction, reflection, and diffraction in, in one, one unit, one, one system. Uh, just as an example, one of the basic standard products which we have, we call it IQ Linear. It's flat, uh, single component optics, which is intended for installation in front of the LED stripe. And depending on which structure you will choose, you can get a different, different distribution with high efficiency and high level of control uh, uh, over the, over the uh, outgoing light. Here you can see uh, just, just the idea, how does the structure on the surface look like in this case? Maybe some of you had a chance to visit us on Light and Building this year, where we uh, presented besides this, uh, uh, let's say, standard products, we presented also more complex systems 
of components for building luminaires, uh, uh, ideas how to create a multi-component optical system as also our activities in the field of uh, production of, let's say, general uh, freeform uh, plastic components with nanostructured surfaces. And you could also see there uh, some selection of the luminaires which our customers are building based on our components and you could see there, see there, the, uh, see there uh, the advantages of our technology. Okay, I already said that one of the main philosophy of our company is to integrate the technology under one roof and uh, this is really a key thing and uh, makes us very flexible and attractive for our customers. Actually, the production process uh, consists of four main blocks and we have a key, key expertise in all of them. In design and simulation, we are focused on uh, design approaches, how to design the diffractive optic for various application already for decades. So we can calculate the nanostructure over the surface to deliver the requested optical function. Mastering is another strong field. Uh, we rely usually on direct writing using either electron beams or laser beams. Uh, here you can see that really the spectrum of the structures which we can manufacture is, is broad. From point of view of tooling, we are using different tooling approaches, but the, the primary one is uh, uh, producing the uh, nickel tools by electroforming. So we are not machining the blocks of steel. We are growing the tools from liquid. The specialty here is that we can do it up to the form of two by one meter because we need for it for some of our machines. So this is quite uh, quite interesting, I think. And last but not least, the mass production itself. So uh, we have several roll to roll lines based on uh, direct uh, hot embossing in the substrate and UV casting as well. And we also have step and repeat technologies in both of this in both of these uh, directions. Besides this, let's say, key uh, production technologies, we have a bunch of auxiliary technologies like printing, of course, roll-to-roll, -roll, metallization and demetallization, again, roll-to-roll -roll processes, slitting, cutting, lamination, and so on. And again, last but not least, metrology, because we are able or we need to have a quality control uh, of our products in every, every manufacturing step, including the roll-to-roll -roll, uh, roll -roll techniques. So what uh, we can offer to you uh, of course, we can offer to you the whole process, the mass uh, mass production, but we can also offer to you the part of the process. So we believe that we are quite strong in optical design, especially if it's focused on nanostructured uh, surfaces for lighting applications. But we also are quite strong in designing of complex optical systems, which are using also conventional components like reflectors and blur reduction components and similar. Uh, Mastering is another another category, so we can use the, the the technologies which I mentioned, direct writing using laser and electron beams, and the, the tooling here primarily uh, nickel nickel uh, tooling up to the large format two by one meter. From point of view of mass production itself, the primary technology is roll to roll uh, production of optical films. It can be either off the shelf products or customized products which we can develop for you or we, which we can manufacture according to your design. And those rigid components with nanostructured surfaces, uh, manufactured using different technologies, embossing, injection molding, and similar plastic processing techniques. And we can also deliver much more general development uh, in the field of optics and re related manufacturing technologies. Under some circumstances, we are open to technology transfer to partners and customers if it makes sense from a business perspective. So that's what we can offer to you and uh, what we are searching for. Of course, it seems like we have a complete process, but we are still searching for some innovation. And in front of everything, we are searching for customers from lighting industry, not only the general lighting, but also other fields like automotive and similar. We are searching for partners for joint commercial developments because we are doing a lot of development projects for, for, for many customers. So uh, uh, you are welcome if, uh, if you would like to cooperate with us. We are trying to still search for new technologies and improve the capabilities. So we would like to create a synergy between our technologies and your technologies to be able to deliver new exciting products to the market. And uh, the last thing is a special thing, which is our focus uh, recently. Now we are focused on, on uh, 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 let's say, production technologies uh, based on extrusion and injection molding, where we can directly create nanostructured surfaces in this in this uh, uh, production technique. So if you are active in this in these areas, we are we are uh, uh, very interested in potential cooperation. So that's uh, briefly about our company and uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer them.
Thank you very much, Marek, uh, for this interesting presentation and overview of, uh, of your capabilities in this field. Any question for, for Marek, you can uh, raise your hand through Zoom. Yes, Daniela, Daniela Cartos from uh, Forveila. Please, Daniela. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, I just have a short question concerning the design and simulation uh, topic. Um, especially for lighting, it is also important to simulate the components in the situation you want to use it. Do you have a kind of interface between your, simul or your design and a simulation software that is uh, available on the market or typically used? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So interface between our in-house developed software and uh, commercially available tools or? Yes, uh, to to simulate the behavior of your uh, designed optics in the setup later. Okay, I think you know that it's 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 quite difficult that the tools available on the market are not capable of simulating diffractive structures in in the, the full full spectrum of properties, uh, and uh, we are using the combination. So we are combining ray tracing softwares with some additions uh, which are in-house developed. And uh, honestly, what we are also doing, we uh, what is integrated in our design tools, it's some experimental data from the measurements. Because you know, in, in diffraction, diffractive optics, it's very difficult to somehow consider all the parameters. So especially for writing applications, what we are doing, we have a big library of structures which already were produced through all these mass production technologies. So the distortions, all the kind of distortions are included in this data, and we are using, the, there's a feedback loop, but we are using this in the design process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the question is if something from these tools is available for general public, then the answer currently is, is no. <laughs> but of course, we are able to deliver to our customers some tools if it's needed for them to apply our products. Yeah, so let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was exactly what I would like to know. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Daniela. Any other question? Marek, I'm just wondering, um, because it, this technology actually presents a lot of advantages, you know, uh, for, for lighting industry. Uh, I, I'm wondering what are the main challenges uh, we have to, or you have to overcome now, you know, to make these technologies um, and to make it replace, you know, conventional optics. What What, what is the main challenge for you? It depends on application. There are different different applications. It's different for let's say indoor general lighting, different for street lighting, different for automotive. Yeah. So well, there is one group of challenges. It's let's say economy of the process because if you are producing it for a, let's say volume application, so the cost is something that is very important for you. And yeah? mm -hmm. so how to make this sophisticated thing to work and to produce to produce it in a in a let's say cost effective way. It's one thing. Uh, if you are aiming for some, let's say, high-end applications where you really care about about the precise optical function, then it's about pre precision, about the uh, let's say uh, suppressing the distortion. The smaller the the features are, the bigger the scattering is, which is not controlled. Yeah. So there are some some let's say uh, uh, challenges which are well, it's almost a, a basic research how how to do this. Yeah. Uh, so, so these are the these two two groups. Uh, in the end, the general conclusion after after the decade, which we focus on this, is that uh, it's always uh, uh, good to think about some let's say combination or synergy of conventional mm -hmm. elements and diffractive elements. Yeah, of course, the idea that you will just use a single surface diffractive element and you will solve all the problems, it looks nice. But unfortunately, it's not always possible. Honestly, it's almost never possible because it's better to use some combination. Yeah? So mm. this is also another message that we are search, uh, searching for partners who, who are strong in, let's say, conventional components or micro optics where it's uh, more micro there than, than in our case, and, and we can combine it together. Yeah. So these are these are general challenges, you know, uh, to use diffractive optics and maybe the one theoretical challenge, which is on the background always is how to use diffractive elements for white light, because diffractive elements usually in holography, especially it's about dispersion. Dispersion is working uh, in, in uh, for your interest because you can create color images. But if you are producing it for lighting applications, then it must be white, it must be perfectly homogeneous. So uh, to, to have this under control is the biggest challenge from point of view of, let's say, physics and how to do it. Thank you, Marek. And the last question from uh, Shandan Kandelwal from BDCL Lighting Crystal Illumination Technology. So please, you can ask your question. 
Yeah, hi, Marek. Hi. Uh, there's a there's a question like uh, I've seen the products at the at the fair. Yeah. All the product streams to be developed uh, mainly for the SMDs, small small size LEDs. So uh, for the linear fixtures mainly. Is there any option for for the spotlights also? Do you have any uh, specific optics which can be used for bigger form factor LEDs? which we can use in uh, standard spotlights? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we dem we are using for demonstration small LEDs because the smaller the LED, the higher the special coherence is and the better, better choices you have and the better control over the light you can have. Uh, of course, you can design the structure for larger chips, but then it depends what's the intention. If you would like to achieve narrow beams, you have to make a fixture quite big because the principal limitations are the same as for conventional optics. Yeah. So the, the short answer is yes, we can do it. It's not among the standard products. We can do it, but we have to be aware of some principal physical limitations. So if you have a chip on board, uh, 25 millimeters in diameter, then you cannot make luminaire, which is two millimeters thick and has a, a beam of uh, five degrees or whatever. Yeah. So uh, then you have to think carefully what's the advantage of using the diffractive optics. There are advantages. There are advantages because, for example, if you need a large uh, area optics and it's just the film, it's an advantage. It's lightweight. It's cheaper than the large lens. Yeah. So so it's not necessarily miniaturization. What is the advantage of our technology? But uh, you are right that to demonstrate the power of our of our components, we are very often using small chips. On the other hand, we know this is a trend in the industry, not only in high end industries like automotive, but also in in indoor lighting that the chips are still smaller and smaller. And we know that many companies are starting to use CSP chips more often than before. Yeah. So this is this is working in our, in the direction of our interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question and um, and for your participation, Mark. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. And now let's welcome our next speaker. So Julie Bonetto, Senior Optical Engineer at Piseo, and you will talk about free from uh, optics design. So Julie, uh, the floor is yours. You can start your presentation and share, share your screen. OK. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK. So thank you, everyone, uh, for being here with me today. Uh, I will uh, speak about I will speak about freeform optics design uh, as I am senior optical designer for P0, a French company near Lyon. Uh, so first of all, a small presentation of uh, the company. So P0 is a leading innovation platform specialized in the integration of all photonic technologies, uh, different sources like LED, laser, Vexel, and so on. Also sensors, imaging, displays, and we have a huge uh, expertise in materials for optic. Uh, our activity is divided into two big uh, activities. The first one is consulting and engineering. Uh, so we are doing technical feasibility studies, optical design and simulations. Uh, we can also um, uh, be part of uh, the prototype and manufacturing process with some partners. And uh, we can develop and industrialize all innovative systems. And the second part of uh, our activities is an accredited test lab. So we can measure uh, all the radiometry and photometry units in our laboratory. And uh, we can also measure the image quality like NTF or SNR. And uh, we, are, we have also have a photobiological risk assessment test uh, in order to, to provide a test eye safety prevention and also for the skin. Um, we can uh, provide you support, as I said, uh, in a lot of uh, applications. Uh, in uh, illumination, detection, and also visualization problems um, or ideas for customers. Uh, in automotive, security, general lighting, of course, also health and body care and other industries. Um, so we can also uh, provide you optical test bench, custom optical test benches. Uh, act, our activities are quite wide, 
as you can see. Uh, we use some tools, uh, ZMAX uh, for imaging uh, systems and light tools for illumination systems. Uh, concerning me, I am a light tools expert, so I will mainly talk about light tools. And uh, we also have SolidWorks, and we can also do some code uh, with some software with a uh, Python code. So today, uh, the topic is freeform optics. Um, in PZ, we have a huge know-how about freeform optics. Uh, we are able to design and simulate freeform optics. As you can see here, for example, from a LED reset measured uh, by, uh, by uh, providers, for example, or directly by the LED LED uh, manufacturer, then we can um, add a polycarbonate freeform optic, as you can see here, uh, the shape is uh, quiet freeform here, uh, with two different uh, curvatures. And um, as you can see here, uh, on the small animation, you can see that uh, changing the curvature or the local curvature of the lens can uh, drastically change the illumination. So, this is very powerful because um, by small changes, uh, you can have something totally different and you can do the beam shaping that you want. Uh, we can also do optimization. So this is a project that I did uh, in order to, put, for example, to, um, add, to reach the best performances uh, outside of an optical fiber here. Uh, with a freeform mirror and uh, a receiver, which is not on the same plane as with uh, the optical fiber that you can see here. So by optimizing the freeform here, we can reach the best performances on the receiver, like almost 100% uh, of total flux going into the receiver here. And what we can propose at PZO is also characterization. You can see my colleague, my colleague here, uh, who is doing measurements on uh, freeform optic uh, for public lighting. And uh, we have a Ganyu photometer, a huge one. Uh, we can measure intensity. And then, uh, as we have both expertise and measurement uh, means, um, we can. Uh, directly uh, modify and optimize the lens freeform shape in order to uh, have a better uh, performances, for example, if this one is not uh, as uh, we want. Uh, freeform optics are very useful in many applications. Uh, in PZU, we work with a lot of uh, applications. Uh, for example, for automotive, uh, we did a logo projection. So we did the define, definition of requirements with uh, the customer, uh, the luminance he wants, the resolution of the image he wants, and colorimetry, because uh, color deviation uh, is not an option here. Um, we can also, we did the definition of the optical system, for example, a multi-lens for this one, but uh, we tried a lot of optical system before in our feasibility phase. And uh, we did also the optical design of the lenses, including tolerancing. Tolerancing is uh, very important in uh, freeform optics. Uh, as you can uh, see in the animation before, small changes of the curvature can drastically change the beam shaping. So tolerancing is a big part uh, in during phase, this phase of this project. Uh, we can also define the light source, the best light source and operating points. Um, we care about optical, but also electrical and thermal effects uh, on the final systems. And uh, we can optimize the integration of, and uh, we support the customer about it. Uh, a second project is, for example, the illumination for skin cancer diagnostic camera. 
So we did also the requirements, the definition of optical architecture and sizing. So the LED, what, what was the best LED, uh, the placement of LEDs, the, their operating point and thermal management. And on top of each LEDs, there is a freeform optics in order to have uh, the best illumination on the skin and to have the best performances on the camera also. And uh, we did the prototype and also performance characterization in our lab. And the last project is a freeform silicon lens for public lighting. So uh, we did uh, this lens in silicon from scratch in PZO um, with lighters, but also with rhinosaurus. Uh, which is a very powerful 3D uh, uh, mechanical uh, software. And uh, we did also the performance evalu evaluation, uh, optimization and tolerancing uh, with the software. And uh, we support the customer for the industrialization. And uh, we did all the qualification of the lens in the PD PZO accredited laboratory. Um, the topic for today is micro optics. Uh, of course, we can also do micro optics and uh, we can design, optimize, and do simulations of micro optics. For example, here it is a backlight, and we did a five microns uh, height freeform prism on the backlight in order to have a specific luminance uh, distribution out of the backlight. Uh, here, the, the small prisms are uh, on the bottom surface in order to reach uh, the, the uniform uh, illuminance here. And uh, as I said before, a very specific uh, luminance distribution. About micro optics, we design, but we also can, we can also do some characterization. Uh, as you can see here in PZO, you, we have a video luminance camera. Um, for this project, uh, the customer sent us a prototype uh, that he did on his own. And uh, what you can see here is that the light guide is not uh, really uniform. Um, we have the both LEDs here and here and uh, the luminance is not under control. So you can see the luminance is in false color here. And um, we optimize uh, the small dots, micro dots, in order to have a better luminance and better uniformity outside of uh, this um, light guide. So you can see here that now uh, this is very nice, very nice effect. Uh, so thank you. It was a little bit smaller presentation than my uh, speakers than the speakers before. Um, so feel free to ask questions. Feel free to uh, send us uh, uh, your needs if you have, and uh, I will be happy to answer to you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much for this nice overview. Any question for for Julie for Piseo? I, I am I am wondering, uh, Julie, um, yes. for the manufacturing part, um, do you work with uh, with partners in function of the application? If it's automotive, if it's general lighting? Yes, we work with partners, uh, typically uh, in, for injunction parts because we we used uh, polymers, uh, PMMA on PC and others also uh, mainly, and um, we we. We have we have a lot of uh, partners uh, with us. We don't manufacture, so yeah. um, this is also interesting to be here with you, with you because uh, I can uh, have some uh, new uh, address. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. But you do the prototype. Huh? You don't manufacture. You do the design, the prototype, and also the. We do the prototype also with partners. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any question? For Julie. So if you have any needs in terms of design, you can go to, to P0, of course, if you have any project development. Okay.
So thank you again, Julie. And if you need to contact Julie, so you can contact her today, or you can also contact me, and I will introduce you to, to Julie with pleasure. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. And now we welcome uh, Beno Spinger uh, from Lumilet. So you are a lead application engineer optics, and you will talk about fusion of uh, micro LED and micro lens. So um, Beno, you can share your screen and start the presentation. Beno, are you are you among us? Okay, so let's maybe move to the next speaker. So Ralph, Ralph, you are here. I can see you. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Um, so Ralph, general manager at LeoP, so you you can start your presentation on uh, micro nano structure free from optics for lighting application. Okay. So Thanks. yeah. Surprise your well. Try to do that. Um, thank you very much for for um, giving me this platform. Um, uh, the presentation is about micro and nanostructured preform optics for lighting applications. It's it's um, giving an account of um, a couple of projects that we did on this particular topic. Uh, the 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 challenge that you usually have with lighting, in particular with the with sort of high quality lighting, uh, you want to correct for chromatic aberrations and for form errors, because often you want to use a glass substrate for for its um, superiority superiority in the uh, in in structure and and material. So. Here on the right hand side, you see what a pressed glass lens often looks like. So you want to um, correct those local and global uh, shape errors. And on the left hand side, you you see what happens um, when when you uh, use bad optics to do imaging um, projection. It's kind of like projection would be like in my terminology, it's sort of what comes uh, after lighting. So if you have a um, if you have a, a two lens objective, for example, then that's a projective lens that doesn't really do very good imaging, as you can see in this. But it has um, a problem with color correction because it carries only uh, four surfaces, with which you can do that. So we add two more surfaces with um, diffractive uh, optical elements. And those, uh, if done right, meaning if, if designed right and if manufactured accurately, then uh, you will better your, your performance in colors. So you see a few blue and yellow uh, fringes here that are later after the correction. Uh, disappeared. So how do we do that? Uh, it's a it's 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 really um, mm, simple. <laughs> well, it's a uh, you just add a diffractive optical element uh, to the uh, surface of your of your lens. So in this case here, it's an um, uh, it's it's a pressed glass lens. Um, we've intentionally designed it, that the uh, the form is also wrong, but we uh, add a DOE here on the left. You can see for size, you, you see the approximation. Uh, the structure is diamond turned, which allows us to go to really um, a small ready. And, um, well, oh, actually, the lens is aspherical. Of course, you see that, right? Um, and the design, uh, we use just what what you said before, Marek. We use um, for the for the overall design, we use a freeform software that we that we own, FF Optic, uh, and then we have our own uh, utilities that do the DOEs on top of that, because they need to be considered in uh, together and. As everybody knows, the, the commercial software packages don't really do that. So when you uh, when you then manufacture this, um, 
here the lens uh, intentionally in the wrong shape, then correct it for the for the silicone, and then including um, uh, correct it for the shape, uh, including the diffractive optical elements. We use a casting process and put silicone onto that glass uh, using uh, a primer. So the mold can be accurately cut and you see um, how that's done. Uh, surface uh, steps are sort of uh, two micron, one to two micron high. And surface quality is good. Um, still, uh, you want to make sure that stray light is limited and that has a linear dependence on the radius of the diamond cutting tool and later on the process that you replicate the structure into the product. So here we did that in, the, in a two lens objective and you can see um, the red part is when you use a four micron diamond tool. Uh, the lower curves are the ones for the stray light, the upper ones are those for the, uh, for the well, irradiance in the target. And you can see that um, when then you move to the uh, to a one micron um, diamond, then um, um, your, your image becomes better and your stray light uh, is reduced. Of course, when you have this, uh, this is also something um, for LEDs, it's not really white light. So the correction for the color you do between those two tips here uh, for the wavelengths, because um, you can correct, of course, um, re really accurately or completely only two wavelengths, and everything else still will create some of your of your lighting uh, of your chromatic issues. Um, yeah, so it's a linear, basically a linear um, correlation, and we have been happy to do diamond turning or with our partners to diamond turning down to half a micron tip radius, which helps a lot. Um, let's see, if, like from experience, like four micron is not really acceptable. Uh, one is good, less is better. So as we also want the, the microstructures, uh, we have sort of the, the real Fresnel lenses, the Fresnel Fresnels, which are in the range of millimeters or um, half millimeter, quarter millimeter, where geometrical optics apply and where refraction is the, uh, the thing that direct, that bends your beam. So the dispersive power there is positive and uh, the correction, the DOE is actually a kinoform uh, Fresnel lens, which is a Fresnel lens, but it's just a thousand times smaller. So. Uh, the height is a, is around a, uh, around the wavelength of, of light, and the uh, the physical optics apply, not the geometrical. And diffraction bends your beam, so the dispersive power is negative. And this is really the combination that allows you to to uh, to correct for the chromatic aberrations. I put these two together because uh, we would like to uh, start with a combination, which would which would give us flat optics, um, advantage of like uh, of planes, um, put everything uh, on a glass sheet. Um, so the manufacturing of the optics, both the microstructured Fresnel and the nanostructured Kinoform can be done uh, on a single surface in a single diamond turning around, which is probably interesting, not only for the mold, but also for the, uh, for the manufacturing. Room. Um, so the replication we do by casting in silicone on glass, because that's what, what we know. And uh, I told you that stray light um, is within reason when, when the diamond radius is under a micron. And what we can do is we can design the lens, the asphere or the Fresnel freeform using FF optic, and we can uh, design the DOE. Uh, corrected for color operations. Uh, we can manufacture that in silicone on glass, um, the lenses, the Fresnels, and uh, the DOEs. 
Um, what you can do for us, of course, is <laughs> bring in the projects, right, as usual. Um, but but we'd, uh, we'd be also interested in um, transferring our process, um, looking how we uh, can continue and grow with this. Right. Um, if you have any questions, that would be, I would be happy to take them. Thanks very Thank much. You, Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, presenting this, uh, this interesting um, process. Mm -hmm. Do you have any question for Ralph? Ralph, what, what kind of with this uh, this manufacturing process? What kind of um, of market you are you are targeting today? Uh, so of course, I guess uh, lighting, general lighting. But but do you have any other any other market you are targeting? Yeah, well, automotive is one market um, because their projection is a yeah. uh, is seen as a game changer. Uh, it's uh, as usual in optics uh, or in lighting especially is you'd like to be in general lighting, but then uh, you have to find somebody who has mm. the budget to really do speciality optics. So most things can be done by um, simple um, optical uh, things. Um, we have like the, the initial goal of all this is to, to, to bring the compressed glass into the imaging domain so that we can do qualities that you cannot really just do with 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 the pressed glass may it be float or may it be aspheres that that come out of a machine um, we would uh, increase the accuracy to the levels where you can do projection mm. okay thank you any question for for Ralph please Okay, thank you again, Ralf. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, and uh, now, Beno, you are back. Beno Spinger? Yes, yes good. I can hear you. Yeah, that's good. So, Beno Spinger, uh, Lead Application Engineer Optics at uh, Lumilet. So, you will talk about uh, fusion of micro LED and micro lens. So, please, Beno. Yes, thank you, for, uh, Jeremy, for the introduction. Um, yeah, um, um, let's say, um, I will talk about uh, a little bit uh, um, uh, different topic. Of course, we coming as Luminets from the LED, as a LED manufacturer side, I will give a short introduction to our company, still hoping that you all know uh, us already. Um, of course, um, like I said, it's a little bit off because I will talk about automotive uh, headlighting because that's what I'm personally doing most. But I've heard from other speakers that, uh, let's say, nearly all companies so far also interested in, in, in automotive. So it, it's a little bit not 100% focused on uh, general lighting. However, what I will discuss can maybe also transfer it for other applications. Um, yeah, and the, the idea is, of course, uh, if, if we talk about headlighting uh, in automotive uh, coming to new optical systems. So what I'm focused personally is also on innovations and evaluating early evaluating on possible new uh, applications for um, our LEDs. Um, and uh, that is what I would present as more a, a vision um, uh, in, in terms of uh, how, how it could uh, develop. Um, like I said, uh, I hope uh, I don't have to uh, introduce uh, the luminates uh, um, uh, to, to many of the people. Of course, we are still a really global company with uh, still um, about uh, 6,000 employees. And uh, let's say we are positioned worldwide. Of course, yeah, I'm located in uh, Aachen, uh, somewhere here in, in uh, the center of Europe. Uh, however, we have also headquarters in uh, US, at San Jose in California, and uh, also manufacturing in, uh, in Asia. We're doing, um, uh, we're doing LEDs and we're doing still automotive lamps. So that's the combination uh, uh, that came from Philips. And that's a combination of these two um, sectors, the LED manufacturing as LED sector and the automotive sector is combined. That is Lumilets. 
and um, naja, and uh, we're still doing also still conventional lamps, but of course, the focus is more on LED uh, products. And uh, what you can see is here the overview about our LED products. Uh, basically, of course, we have a lot of illumination products, so these big uh, chip on board products uh, were asked for. Uh, of course, uh, we're doing a lot of automotive portfolio where you still see the, the old Kensington and Xenon lamps. But of course, we have also a wide portfolio on um, uh, light sources for, for headlighting, um, uh, small LEDs and big LEDs arrays. Um, yeah, and even uh, we're doing some, some higher integrated solutions where we have uh, some kind of modules uh, on one hand, uh, where the LED is already, uh, let's say, uh, higher, higher integrated, uh, where, where the heatsink is maybe integrated. We have some regulated lamps that is automotive. And then we have, of course, uh, special uh, products so for, 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 for flash. Um, but of course, also for, for, for agriculture or even they are also high integrated products. And uh, last but not least, we have also a kind of uh, portfolio for aftermarket products. Um, speaking about automotive, like I said, that is more my focus. And you see that, of course, we have uh, a lot of different application fields where we are also uh, um, providing uh, light sources from. That is on, on one hand, we see all these headlighting with adaptive beam. Uh, lighting with, I think uh, we all partly already have heard about it, um, uh, where you talk about uh, beam adaption. Um, and then we have, of course, uh, the car exterior where more um, uh, smaller light sources are required, uh, where we have colors uh, included. And, um, and then we have, of course, uh, uh, the singling uh, applications uh, on, on the car. And uh, then uh, last, but uh, now coming more, then of course we have all the, uh, also light sources for, for sensing, uh, where uh, then also infrared and let's say other yeah, yeah, colors are uh, getting important. Now, um, for these uh, adaptive headlighting um, um, application field, um, uh, of course, we see that, of course, uh, more and more um, light sources are needed um, and smaller, more smaller light sources. Uh, so, uh, for, for, the, for example, adaptive driving beam, uh, where the beam can now adapt, uh, we be switching. Uh, yeah, already uh, hundreds and, 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 and of course uh, now in the future also uh, thousands uh, or ten thousands of uh, LEDs on and off to making an adaptive uh, beam and uh, one light source is what we're developing for this is uh, a so-called uh, micro LED I have to say micro LED array um, and basically this is an example uh, of a light source uh, um, this uh, product for micro LEDs, and this is uh, an array of based of 20,000 pixels. So let's say what you see here is in fact a, a group of 20,000 LEDs placed close to each other um, on a CMOS. Uh, basically, that is required, of course, if you have so many LEDs, you somehow need to switch the LEDs and you need some electronic to switch it, and that needs to be close to other LEDs. Otherwise, yeah, you would get uh, routing uh, problems. So that is a, a kind of integrated product. And um, yeah, so this is on a, let's say, scale of a few millimeters where you have uh, all these 20,000 pixels. That means in the end, we have per LED something like 40 micron. Yeah? So, and um, let's say how it is uh, then um, used is uh, you have, of course, a kind of imaging optic that is an imaging um, the surface of uh, the, the module. And uh, then, of course, uh, what you can see if the LEDs uh, are changing and uh, switching on and off dynamically, you can uh, have your beam uh, adapted or generated uh, according to what you want to have. And of course, here I have a, only an example of a beam. But of course, you can also have uh, projections of image uh, snowflakes and uh, let's say more uh, complicated uh, examples. Um, yeah, and that is basically uh, an, an example how micro LEDs in automotive are currently used uh, in headlighting. 
um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, typically, of course, you have some um, um, uh, requirements for the optic um, that are, of course, very um, uh, yeah. In, in some hands, uh, hands special, um, but um, uh, of course, because uh, you, you need a good imaging quality, but on the other hand, also a high efficient, high NA system uh, to collect uh, a lot of light because our LEDs mainly radiating still per LED Lambert. And it means uh, if uh, the NA of the optical system is not uh, so high, you're losing a, a lot of light. Um, on the other hand, that's not from our side, but of course, it's a trend. What we see, of course, or let's say it's the beginning of a trend, and it may be also here uh, well known uh, that we have in, uh, in head first examples of uh, MLA based uh, headlamps, uh, where we have uh, micro lens arrays with shields inside um, uh, that uh, can be used. Um, to generate um, um, automotive beams, um, and, and there are first examples on the road. Um, problem is here, or let's say basically you have a LED light source, and then um, uh, then you need first of kind of pre-optic. We see a few examples here um, of the pre-optics. Um, where um, always the LED is first collimated to make a more narrow beam, and then you uh, illuminate with these a kind of um, uh, micro lens array. And um, uh, these, uh, yeah, these pre uh, optic is required to get a narrow beam. What is in later uh, that you dot not get unwanted crosstalk between the micro lenses, and um, and of course also you want to have a good uh, beam distribution. Um, yeah, problem is, of course, uh, that you still have a rather complicated optical system if you look like this. No? So let's say it's just several um, LED, uh, sorry, um, micro lens uh, array groups or modules, you might can, uh, can say, and they all have an LED and a pre-optic and then the micro lens array. So this is still very complicated and also not 100% Flat, of course, not less deep than than conventional systems, but uh, yeah, still uh, not uh, yeah, hundred percent in the direction we want to go. And on the other hand, uh, these pre-optic is, is really required to get a good beam collimation. Now the idea is, um, can we combine micro LEDs with uh, micro lenses to get also uh, in the pre-collimating uh, element already a good collimated beam. So um, that would, of course, uh, give the ability to really shrink the system. Um, of course, what you need different to the micro uh, LED I have shown, you know, where we had the 20,000 pixels closely spaced, we need to separate the LEDs you know, so that we have uh, some kind of uh, separation between the, the, the LEDs. Um, and, and then we can, uh, of course, add uh, a micro lens array to it and uh, can get a collimated um, flat light source, I would say. And that's a little bit, uh, that's what I want to discuss further. So basically, uh, if you're looking, um, this is only an example calculation. Uh, um, if you would uh, like to think about, uh, to integrate uh, now everything on a flat substrate, um, from from etendu uh, calculations and uh, including some losses, um, then you can do with uh, 50 by 100 micrometer LED. You could already uh, generate a sufficient collimation of this kind of beam, so two two and a half degree by by, by five degree. Um, that would be possible um, if you have millimeter. Um, lenses according to these LEDs. No? So let's say in a one millimeter pitch, um, uh, this array can do this. Um, of course, looking at the efficiencies of LEDs, um, you would still need something uh, like, uh, 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 yeah, from 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 uh, from 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 area, something like uh, two thousand of these LEDs, and that would end up in a board of twenty square. Centimeter. That is a reasonable size, and with this um, uh, combination, I think it is, uh, would be possible to gener generate sufficient amount of light to make low beam and high beam application. And then you would have the complete headlamp 
on a flat board. Of course, what would be required is that, um, that you have an MLA, uh, what is thermally robust, because if you go close to the LEDs, um, uh, you have to uh, um, survive temperatures in the range of 130 degrees. If you would be attached to the LEDs, it would be even 150. Um, so you see there is some kind of um, um, uh, challenge still for the micro lens arrays. So that means uh, you need to, to look for, for good material. Um, and that would bring me to, to, to what we can provide and what, uh, what uh, let's say, what we need, would need uh, for this. Um, the combination really, uh, I think, in the, further, uh, in the future would make sense. Um, and uh, it seems to be also feasible to get in the uh, uh, um, good direction with these kind of uh, combination. Um, a 20 uh, square centimeter um, uh, headlamp uh, seems to be a reasonable size. A further miniaturization would be maybe difficult in the sense of you creating too much glare. So, of course, cost-wise, it's maybe attractive, but uh, and maybe it would be also possible to do, uh, uh, do it smaller. But on the other hand, uh, then you're getting already um, concerns of glaring headlamps if they're getting too small. That would mean, on the other hand, uh, if you do uh, go in this direction, that you need also here MLA systems and boards that are cost effective, because, of course, our customers are, would not uh, be willing to pay much more for the light sources. And at the moment, we sell, let's say, a few uh, square centimeter, uh, square millimeters as light source for a car. Now we would discuss about square centimeters. That means we need, of course, more cost-effective board solutions. And the MLAs needs to be also cost-effective because we're adding an additional element to make this kind of pre-optic um, what has also a certain size. And then what I mentioned already, we need a certain material um, uh, what is uh, surviving of these high temperatures. But of course, in the combination, also these temperature changes that we expect in close to the LED and in an automotive environment. So the material should be able to survive minus 40 to 130 degrees. So what we could offer is, of course, to generate light sources with precise uh, um, uh, placed LEDs. Um, on a board, so let's say the substrate and the deep placement, but we still would need uh, to find a jointly way is, uh, is, is to create this combination of uh, MLA, what is of course uh, robust, but also then uh, can be pre precisely aligned to the LEDs, because here we talk about also of single-digit micron accuracy, what would be required between lens and LED. So that uh, is also from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beno. Thanks a lot um, for this presentation and also showing and sharing uh, these requirements and challenges you have um, in this market. Uh, so any question for, for Beno, you can raise your hand. We have already a question in the chat from uh, Eduardo Alvarez uh, from Plascolit. Eduardo, do you want to ask your question by yourself? I can do it if you want. So, so um, they know in the USA, many concerns about glare for other drivers, cyclists and pedestrians from uh, LED headlamps. How is this being addressed with the system you just show during your presentation? Okay, that is, uh, has many aspects. Also, one aspect I, I, I said already, um, the overall size of the headlamp should not shrink too much. Um, even if Formally, the glare is measured in intensity on, on the oncoming traffic. Uh, the perceived glare is, or also the, 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 yeah, the perceived glare is really depending on the luminance of the glare source. And if the headlamp is getting too small, that is a, a problem. That is really a, a valid concern for these kind of headlighting systems. If we considering MLA systems getting, giving the ability to making smaller headlamps. So that's what I discussed we couldn't get much smaller. Bigger uh, is only a question of cost, but optical would be nice. The second aspect is, of course, is that MLAs in itself, if the light source is very small and if our collimation approach, what I discussed here, would be working well, can generate 
very sharp image. So that means that we can also have a very sharp beam would, would give the ability to create less glare light. So that would be really um, an opportunity to making a sharper, good beams in the car um, that, um, uh, that are, um, yeah, uh, that uh, would give a good performance with less glare. And then last but not least, there is of course uh, already uh, in the initial discussion, uh, the question if not an adaptive beam uh, can uh, uh, enable less glare to the oncoming traffic. But so let's say what I discussed before is an adaptive driving beam, for example. Um, but I have to admit the source has some, some aspect, but uh, the complete car headlight system getting very complicated and as um, as we speak about dynamic headlighting, um, and then also the sensing, the, 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 the kind of measuring, the adjustment of everything. So that gets very important uh, for this kind of discussion. Thank you, uh, Another question from uh, Urban Cruz, from Cruz uh, Leach Planner. So you, Urban, you can, uh, can ask your question. You are muted, huh? by the way. Okay, so maybe maybe Jonas Jonas Villans from UPMT. Yes, um, thank you, Benno. As usual, very interesting presentation. Uh, it, it's not really a question. I, I think uh, I, I think we should talk in the coming days. Let's say uh, I, I believe we probably have in our hands uh, interesting uh, things to collaborate with you on, on this kind of topic. Uh, so I, I will send you an email after the the meeting. Uh, definitely, I, I think we have, as you've seen during my presentation, uh, probably uh, solutions to manufacture this kind of this kind of parts. Yeah, thank you. I, I was I've seen uh, I've really well noticed the opportunity to use polycarbonate. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Good. Uh, Ivan, any any question? You are muted. Okay, so thank you again, Beno. Thank you very much for our presentation. So now we welcome uh, Henrik Madsen, CEO and co-founder of uh, SPIO Systems. And Henrik, you will talk about miniaturized optical engines uh, on wafer level via SPIO technology. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Denmark. <laughs> I um... I would uh, tell you about uh, first what what we're doing and and where and, and how we are utilizing these uh, free from optical um, capabilities in in our technology. Um, Spire technology is is a is a is a new uh, way of of producing optics in in, in volume. Um, it's a it's a transition between a common. Um, way of, of producing an instruments when you have individual objects uh, in the box. So we transfer this um, into a, a, a planar wafer approach where we, um, first of all, can miniaturize the optical uh, engines, uh, but also we can bring down the cost of it. Um, so the first aim is to, to do smaller uh, engines. And the secondary uh, benefit is that it's also uh, more cost effective. Um, we are based in 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 farm north of Copenhagen, uh, 20k. We are from 2020, um, and um, just to give you a brief, what is uh, what is we're doing? It's maybe easy to to do what we're doing differently compared to what to do today. So this is an example of, of a common instrument that you are utilizing individual objects, uh, put it into a box, and, and uh, most of the, the cost is easily accounted with, with, the, with the assembly phase, so it's not, the optic, not the component itself, but, but the, the assembly. Um, and also, when you're doing manual assembly, uh, it's very hard to scale into high volume and also require a lot of... Um, uh, manpower and equipment to to scale it, um, and also the size is is a matter of stability of this system here compared to a smaller size. 
not to say there's not a bad product, it's very high quality and it's known for many decades how to produce it. Um, opposite what we do, we would do exactly the same functionality, but we would do it on a different platform. So we want to learn from the electronic chip manufacturing industry where they have transferred from uh, um, into to wafer level to stress on, on wafer levels. We do the same on optics. So we we are producing in 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 planar wafers, and we're doing our optical on on a on a polymer on a, on a wafer, uh, and we are producing tons of of elements in one operation. But also the most interesting, uh, interesting is that we are doing the assembly the of these uh, instruments on wafer. Mean that we we can we can assembly a wafer stack and then we assembly in parallel thousands of, of small engines. That's the most promising approach uh, with this technology. Um, also, when you do a lot of parallel processing, uh, you do also le require less machinery and also less manpower to do the same uh, amount of, of uh, instruments. Um, and also the size itself also reduce the, the the environmental impact on the on the optical uh, engines. I mean that makes it more robust to to shock and temperature and and, and other um, external impacts. That's in principle what what we're doing. Um, so so we're not doing something new optical functionality, but we're doing a new way of, of producing optics. So this is just to compare the, the same uh, functionality, but with a different approach. Um, what, how do we do this? Uh, we, we are we are learning from their um, graphic industry. They they have done role to play for for many years and role to role. We are using this technology because it's very fast, also uh, uh, potentially very cheap. So. We are imprinting um, in a polymer layer on a glass substrate with a root plate. Um, and that's where the free from optics come in place because this uh, process do have some shrinkage in, in the polymerization phase. We use that in uh, we use that free from capabilities to, to compensate for some of it. But also um, to, to the master, for the replication, we need a master that can do optics, uh, not only one kind of optics, but we, we have a hybrid optics elements on, on, a, on a master, meaning that we need to generate masters that has a variety of optics in, on the same surfaces and including a free from uh, in that um, surface. Last um, part is to to take these imprinted wafers and, and put them together. So you're combining two or more wafers to generate to to combine our optical engine. So we are doing uh, the engine on on wafer level, and and finally, you dies the the individual engine into single dies for further integration. That's our technology for 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 producing um, the the engines on on. And wafers. Um, what can we uh, what put what what optics capabilities can we put in on a wafer? We can act, actually take all the standard optical features and elements known from the, from the design uh, toolbox. We can put in lenses, uh, spherical lenses, aspherical lenses, toroids, um, also prismatic structures, um, and and uh, big grooves. Uh, and if you code it, that will be act like a mirror. We can put in gratings, uh, both binary gratings, but also multi-layer gratings. Uh, slanted grating is, is a little bit challenging, um, and not least free forms. Um, the free forms are utilized when when we uh, uh, use optical off-axis uh, optics. This is an example, an user example of, of a small um, receiver optics for receiver module. Uh, it's a two, two stack layer. Um, the green is glass, uh, the yellow is, is the polymer, and the, the colored, uh, small colored section are the optical elements. Um, so where does the free form come in place? It, um, it has a, a 
double use in, in spy tunnel ID. Uh, when we have off-axis uh, rotation symmetric optics, we, we utilize uh, to, to machine the, this section of off-axis element or, uh, locally, so, so the surface is not any more rotation symmetric if we look at a small piece itself. So that's where we're using the freeform capabilities to, to generate a, a small section of a rotation symmetric uh, elements, but also to, to do optical uh, color corrections, but not least also to, to do, to do um, compensation when we are imprinting uh, our, our optical elements. There are some enable uh, swingage taking place, and that can be compensated by by adding a freeform surface correction uh, to to the optics. Um, to the right, you see a, a small example of, of a micro spectrometer a spectrometer unit. Uh, it's about say, six by five millimeter size, and that's where we use the off-axis uh, uh, optics in 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 that system. And that's uh, some one of the the elements are machined like a like a free form. Uh, what what machine do we use for for it? We 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 uh, use a standard uh, on the market uh, alter position machine, um, single point diamond twin. And it has been covered by by Jonas uh, previously, so it's not uh, something unique for for us. Um, that's the tool we are using for machining, um, but also how to be certain that the, the, the shape of it is, is correct. So we, we're measuring the, both the, the, the master, but also over the replicated pieces uh, with a contact probe and um, that generates a, a point cloud. And that point cloud is, 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 uh, is a, Combined on combined, it's uh, simulated with with the normal shape, and by that method we can isolate the, the the uncertainty or the form error in the machining and also the imprinting or the replication. So by that method we we can do a, a loop, so we can uh, uh, we can come down to really small form uh, form error in in our optics. Um, <clears throat> And also, we can do several iterations to to achieve a low um, low form deviation from the what we what we're aiming. Um, just to summarize, what what SPAR, a stack planner integrated optics, it can, can miniaturize your your optics uh, signal processing on a very small. Uh, form factor units, uh, but also uh, uh, including the, the free form utility. Um, the long term is that you can can read your volume on a small or short time frame compared to a standard approach. And um, by our method, we can do true hybrid functionality, meaning that we can put in several different kind of optics that's normally not is, is able to do with standard approach. You can put in gradings and, and meter structures uh, or lenses on the, on the same items next to each other. Um, the challenge, of course, is that it's very new technology and it's not yet matured. Um, and also uh, the struggle is would be to to maintain the manufacturing tolerance in, 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 in high volume when you go up to, to six or eight inches wafers. Um, uh, today we are we are aligning the wafers actively, but um, really nice to have is, is align the wafers passively. So that would be a challenge that we reach out to people that uh, can help us doing that uh, transition also. That was in short what we are doing and where we utilize the, the free from capabilities or um, freedom in, in our technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henrik. Thank you very much for, for the presentation for the interesting technology. Uh, just a question re regarding, you just, you mentioned passi passive alignment uh, of wafers. Can you, can you tell us more about what is passive alignment? Mean that uh, today you are, you are monitoring two wafers and uh, monitor how well they aligned and we, Manipulate one wafer to the other, so so they're aligned perfectly to each other. Because 
The upscale functionality is is jumping from wafer to wafer, meaning that the light is need to be aligned very accurate to to wafer to wafer. Uh, it could be that uh, that grating is is diverting the, the light from from the grating wafer to to the secondary wafer where the uh, collimating lens is. So we need very good alignment between the wafers. Today, that's done with active alignment and and bonded together. But um, that would be uh, beneficial in the future to have a pass alignment, meaning that you you add on small alignment features, mechanical features. That's where that can self-align the two wafers when you put them together. Mm. Hope that uh, would be your answer to it. Mm. Okay, so. Any question for for Henrik? Okay, so thank you again, Henrik. Thank you again yeah. for, for, for your last presentation. And now welcome um, our last speaker of the day. So Knut uh, Bredenmeyer, development engineer at uh, TechnoTeam. And you will talk about um, characterization and measurement of ray data for micro-optics with near field goniophotometers. So Knut, you can, uh, you can share your screen and start the presentation. Yeah, so I hope you can see my screen. Yes? Yes, yes. So a uh, good afternoon from my side. Um, so um, I'm sitting on the other side of this topic. I'm sitting on the measuring side. Um, so our company uh, provides measurement systems for all kind of image resolved photometric or calorimetric measurement tasks. Um, my field is uh, the Gonia photometer products. Um, but we also have different applications for um, <clears throat> camera-based um, topics, image luminance, luminance measuring cameras, for automotive uh, measurements and for display metrology. It's a very uh, upcoming topic. Um, and um, screen photometry-based systems for automotive uh, headlamp measurements is very popular because these uh, challenging challenging uh, projection um, systems uh, are also challenging for the measuring system. Um, this means that you cannot do it with conventional conventional types. We need uh, image resolved measurements. And here we have uh, some applications. Yeah, but now I'd like to focus more on ray file measurements. Um, what is Ray data. I think all of you know it. Just a few words about it. Uh, ray files and ray data and ray sets, um, different terms mean always the same. Um, ray sets or ray data consists of vectors, um, of a large set of vectors. Each vector is carrying luminous flux, at least, or some radiometric um, flux. Uh, also spectral data is added often uh, because especially when you use um, need to consider uh, wavelength depending uh, refraction, then uh, just simulating with uh, luminous flux rays is not very helpful at least. So spectral data is important. Yeah, as I mentioned, a ray file is a large number of such vectors and they represent the complete um, characteristic of the light emission of your light source. Um, yeah, the usage is ray tracing um, and to model the propagation of light through the optical system. Um, of course, this is very interesting if you have uh, optical elements to be simulated um, that are very close to the light source. This means that you cannot simplify it as a point source. You need a special um, resolved uh, sim uh, set of data. Okay. So, but why measuring data instead of just simulating them from uh, synthetic models of the light source? Um, I know that both are existing in the simulating uh, programs, but um, 
it is very hard to generate precise synthetic ray models um, because you need a lot of deep knowledge of the LED technology, uh, of the material behaviors and so on. And this is um, confidential in most cases or the LED manufacturer itself uh, need to do it. Uh, so it's easier to measure the real light emission characteristic and regard the light source as a kind of black box. So we measure what comes out and this describes the real behavior. Um, it is an easy process, relatively easy to measure it. Um, and it can also be done for the final optical component that you developed to prove maybe non-ideal reaction of your optical system and do some inverse ray tracing to find out what, what is the problem. Yeah. Um, so I put some images here that should demonstrate the complexity of the luminous, um, yeah, the distribution of the luminous area. Uh, these are images reconstructed from a ray file. And here you can see very fine structures, ununiformities, and uh, whatever fine structures. Yeah, um, it is hard to to simulate it um, in a synthetic model. So this is part of the measurement result. And when this has an effect on your optical simulation, then it is good to have it in the ray model. So the basic principle of measuring ray data is to use a luminance measuring camera uh, that moves around the light source or you align the light source uh, with respect to the camera and you take thousands of images. Uh, these luminance images, they represent the uh, luminance distribution, uh, especially an angular res resolved luminance distribution, which is the complete characteristic of a light output. This is transformed to the ray data. Um, in principle, that's all. But there are some challenges because um, when you want to have ray files, uh, want to use ray files, they should represent um, all relevant details of your light source. This means yes, tiny, small, ununiform behavior or angular behavior. Um, so you need a high spatial and angular resolution usually. Um, and not only the resolution is important, even more important is the uh, accuracy of the rays. Um, it doesn't help you if you have a very high resolution of the rays, but from different positions, the rays uh, are smoothed along um, different positions so that you get blurred uh, results. Um, so the accuracy of the ray depends on your application. I've set some reconstruction images of very high resolution LED structures here. As you see, I can uh, reconstruct uh, in an easy way, 30 microns uh, grid uh, sizes. Uh, so, so the resolution is much higher here. Uh, also very high angular um, resolution is possible. As you see here in the uh, far field distribution uh, plot here in this 3D plot, it's a very flat side emitting LED um, distribution. Knut. Named LED goniometer. Um, yeah, Knut, sorry, we, we lost you for, for, for 10 seconds, but that's okay. You're back. Yeah, I'm back. Okay, maybe our connection is not <laughs> best here. Okay, we have two uh, systems for measuring small light sources like LEDs. It's uh, our standard system, Rigo 801 LED. It is um, 
it can measure uh, with a ray precision accuracy of 10 microns and a resolution of six microns and a maximum test sample size of 200 millimeters. So, but we can change the lenses. So um, you need different lenses to, to, to have all the um, size ranges. Um, and the minimum size of LED that you can measure in a useful way. I mean, uh, the good relation between uh, resolution and accuracy with respect to the size of the luminous area, I would say it's 100 microns. If it's lower, I think the ratio is not good enough. Um, for higher accuracy, we have developed a micro LED goniometer. We name it micro LED. It's, uh, micro LEDs are available in different sizes. They start from one point something microns uh, and go up to maybe 40 or 80 microns. Um, in this case, it is not intended for image result measurement of really small LEDs of 1.2 microns, for example. It is more intended for the size of, let's say, 30 microns. Um, because we have a ray accuracy of 3 microns and a resolution of 1.2 microns, so this is the, the range where we can measure. And I think this is interesting for all these applications where things are getting smaller. Uh, we have heard this presentation from Luminets where um, a matrix of thousands of uh, some small micro LEDs uh, of 30, 40 microns, I think, um, are presented. And this is especially the size range where we can measure in a very good way. Um, Yeah, so what can we do for you? Uh, we can measure ray files, we can provide goniometer systems, uh, but also other kind of, all kind of measuring application systems for luminance uh, or color. Um, and we are open in developing uh, special test equipment for special applications. So we, we are not interested in selling thousands of the systems. And before this, we do not start work. We are also working on small numbers of uh, equipment. And um, yeah, what can you do for us? Um, we are always interested in getting feedback uh, of using our data. Uh, we are also interested in getting ideas. You, yeah, uh, what what you might want to have, uh, what is usually ray files uh, do not support. Um, I'm thinking about the spectral topic. Spectral ray files is a big topic. Um, if for white LEDs, it's a common task. Uh, easily solved with a two filter, two channel, spectral channel measurement. But maybe in the future, it's getting more challenging because of the different spectral distributions of the uh, LEDs. Um, yeah, so that's all my presentation. Um, I hope it was interesting for you and I'm uh, open for questions now. Thank you, Knut. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yeah, characterization is always an interesting topic. So, any question for for maybe one before the end of the workshop? Do you do you also provide some uh, some characterization services, Knut? Or yeah, um, for um, if it's not too much uh, number of measurements, we can do it. Uh, otherwise, we would uh, prefer to uh, forward it to a service company okay. focused on these measurements. But uh, yeah, if, for example, up to five measurements or something I can do. Okay. Uh, we have um, measurement systems here in our company. 
although usually we are more interested in selling the systems, but sure. we are open, open to do everything. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Knut. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to to give the two last minutes to uh, Jessica Van Eck, um, CEO of Fabulous, for a few words about uh, about the pilot line. And uh, yeah, I would like also to thank all the, the speakers today. So Jessica, the last two minutes are for you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to you know all the participants for being here and the presenters for presenting here. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, I always end with uh, micro-optics is fabulous. So anyone who has any interest in doing anything with micro-optics, please feel free to reach out to fabulous. Um, yeah, maybe a short reminder that uh, we still have uh, some funding available for feasibility studies. If you are wondering if free fire micro-optics could be a solution or... You have a design and you wonder if it's manufacturable, please reach out. And uh, yeah, of course, also a big thank you to Epic for organizing this workshop. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Jessica. And yes, thank you to all our participants, speakers for accepting to, to give this presentation or the, the attendees. So if you have any question regarding Fabulous, uh, you are warmly invited to to contact Jessica or to contact uh, me um, and uh, yeah so feel free to do it thank you very much for your participation again bye thank you bye bye thank you thank you bye thanks bye bye thank you Art. Oh yeah, um, Andy, you can watch the record of the um, of the um, workshop on YouTube. Of course. I was muted. I will. I will. Uh, um, once Vera send send me the the video, I will.